We're very thankful to have Brother Eric Taba, the ministering brother from Windsor, to serve us this morning. Uh, let's keep Brother Eric in our prayers. Brother Eric. Good morning and greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it is an honor to be here. I am super nervous, um, but I trust that the Lord will work through my weakness. Just for those that perhaps don't know me, I, I was born in Hungary. Um, when I was a very little boy, my parents escaped communism. We lived in Germany, so that's where I grew up. I grew up in Germany, went to the Breidenbach Church, that's where I converted. And then in 2000, I married my wife, um, Stephanie Palanaki at that time. Um, and that's what brought me to Windsor. And so I'm trying to preach today in my third language, so bear with me. Before we look into God's word, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we find ourselves here in your presence. It warms our hearts, and we thank you for this opportunity. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that your word is true, and that it promises us that where two or three gather in your name, that you are with us. It, it moves our hearts to know that we don't need a church building per se, but that where those of like precious faith gather in the name of Jesus Christ, you are with them, that you are we here with us, and we, we thank you for that beautiful gift. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that we are the church wherever we, wherever we are, and we thank you that you have made it possible for so many of us to travel from near and from far to be here together in nature, but also surrounded by those that we love so dearly, with those that we walk hand in hand here on earth and exposed once again to your holy word. And as we look into it, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with us, bless us, and speak to us, whether we're young, whether we're old, whether we're saved or unsaved. We know that your spirit knows our individual needs, and so we pray that your spirit would be poured out on each and every one of us, depending on the needs that we have, that you would communicate your will unto us. And help us to be attentive. Help us to be pupils that will also take the le lesson with us and that we would ponder upon it, just as Mary has pondered on the words that she has heard. We pray all these things to Heavenly Father. We already thank you in advance through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. With God's help, I would like to just read a few Verses that are quite well known to us, if you want to follow along, it's in Hebrews 12, the first two verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. These opportunities that we get, they're not just per chance. It's not just a tradition that the Syracuse Church for decades has been having these beautiful outings, or that we have Eastern camp, or that we have other events where we get together. The Lord realizes that sometimes if we just go through routine, that sometimes we perhaps get a little tired, a little sleepy, get too comfortable in, in that routine. And so he allows us to sometimes be pulled out of our routine into a different venue where we can perhaps spend time with those that we don't always see, but also that we're in a different environment. Just like in the Zion Harp, I'm sure that we've all been to singing where sometimes someone picks a song on a new melody, and all of a sudden the words seem to spring to life because we sing it to a melody that we're not familiar with. And so the same is true with gatherings like this, that when we get together, and it's not the usual setting that we're a bit more alert and the Lord can perhaps speak to us in a bit of a deeper level. 
And so I'm hoping that as we look into God's word and as we allow his spirit to work, that we will be able to glean a bit from what we hear. We can read also in Romans 16, uh, Romans 13, sorry. In that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I think we can all agree that as we look at the climate in this world, we have to realize that we live in a time that one would consider the end times. The time just before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a part of us should be excited about that, that we get to live in that chapter in human history. And yet part of us perhaps sometimes has some heavy thoughts as we think of our loved ones who perhaps have not made right with God yet. We think of maybe our co-workers, our friends, our neighbors, those who don't know Christ yet. And we wonder, will there be enough time for them to also taste of his goodness? We sometimes perhaps think of our children and we pray that God would be merciful and continue to call them so that they too would be able to Be saved before it is too late. We can read in this first verse, the writer to the Hebrews makes it very clear that there's certain things in life that need to be put off, especially as we realize that the end is coming nearer, that we would take extra effort to investigate our own lives and see, is there anything that weighs me down? Is there anything in my life that hinders me from freely serving the Lord? That could be so many things. And traditionally, our mind maybe quickly goes to materialism. And as, yes, it is definitely a piece of the pie, but there's so many more things in life that can weigh us down than just materialism. Even a simple word like worry. Like, I'm sure we have all had moments in life where we toss and turn, can't sleep, because there's something on our mind that weighs so heavily on our mind that it robs us of sleep. Trying to figure out how we perhaps pay the next bill. Trying to figure out how we raise maybe some rebellious teens in a godly manner. Worry maybe about the state of this world, and so on and so forth. And I think we have to agree that that worry can definitely weigh us down in such a way that we sometimes find ourselves paralyzed and we don't find the, the energy or the motivation to maybe deal with life itself because the worry consumes us to such a degree. Interesting, I, I, I don't know how to explain my brain, it's, it's complicated, but I like imagery. I am very much a, of someone that if, if I see a picture or I have seen an event, I, that's something that sticks with me. I'm not very good in, in uh, memorizing scripture, sadly. Like, I'm not good in, in memorizing it, maybe, and I blame it on the fact that English is not my first language. But there are certain things, like if I see a picture that drives a point across, that's something I can take with me, and it remains with me for a long time. And so the word worry starts with W, and we have to connect it with this world. Anything that we worry about is worldly. It's something that is of this world that we need to cast off. And how do we do it? We even heard it today in Bible class that we need faith. Faith, which starts with an F, comes from the Father. So we need to cast away anything that is worldly, 
and allow the Father to move in, just like we heard last night, to fill our cup with Jesus Christ, rather than with the cares and the worries of this world. Other things that, that can weigh us down are perhaps a few toxic relationships. Relationships that perhaps, and we talked about that last night as well, that perhaps influence us in a negative way, pull us away from the Lord, make us perhaps go down a path that could even be sinful. Those relationships, we need to end them. Like my friend, if you're struggling to give your life to the Lord and you realize that you have friends in your life that pulled you away from the Lord, you have to end those relationships. You have to prioritize and realize that God has to become your priority, not your friendships. Because it weighs you down. It doesn't allow you to move. Our possessions can also weigh us down. I'm sure we have all seen horrible images of the five states that were affected by, by Hurricane Helene. Imagine being the one that gets the message from the authorities that you need to evacuate. You need to leave everything behind. How easily would you and I be able to leave everything behind knowing that what we have inside us, the Spirit of the Lord and our faith in Christ Jesus is much more great than all of our belongings, our possessions. Would we be able to just leave everything behind and go? We don't have many of them left in our circles, but there's many that experienced similar tragic moments back in the Second World War. The Donauschwaben, and I'm sure there's all, even a few here that were told that it's only a couple hours before the enemy arrived and pack up whatever you can. You have an hour or two and go to save your life. What would you and I pack? Imagine some of them were very rich, had big estates, Big farms, you have two hours and pack up what's most valuable and go. And most likely you will never be able to return. I don't know about you, but those are stories I always really enjoyed. Some interesting facts, how they would really, in a very short period of time, prioritize and really just pack what is essential and leave. Maybe on horseback over the carriage or just with their bags over their over their shoulders with really nothing and it brings me to my thoughts go to Jesus when he sent out his disciples and instructed them too to go with really nothing not a staff not a bag nothing just to go almost empty-handed into the world see if these disciples would have decided to pack up their whole life and go from town to town, it would have been much more complicated for them to go. Now that they had nothing that would weigh them down, they were traveling much easier. They were able to go even to crowded places, marketplaces, share the gospel. But if you're loaded up with all your goods and all your possessions, how do you maneuver through life? There comes now one of those images Many years ago in Windsor, we had a presentation where they did a bit of like a, I think it's called a skit. And the idea was that we, when we enter a marriage, we often, some, often enter the marriage also with lots of baggage. And the image was this, this husband and wife were walking down the aisle, a suitcase full of expectations, a backpack full of dreams, and so you, you picture like this person full of bags and, and toads and like a suitcase being pulled behind them. And now they stand in front of the minister and it's time to kiss the bride. But they have so much luggage around them, they can't even reach each other. That's an image that stuck here, that, that I remember. That we in a Christian walk often find ourselves in similar situations where we carry all these things, all these things that we find important in the moment with us, and we become ineffective in God's kingdom. So we're instructed to lay aside these weights. 
I can't answer whether you have any weights in your life. I know for myself that every single time I go back to the scripture, I find new weights that I've put on that need to go. My brother and sister, we're expected to one day take flight and to be taken up to go with Jesus Christ. There is no room for any baggage. It is time for us now to lay them aside, not in that moment, it's going to be too late. The writer goes on and then also says that sin also easily besets us. Another thing that weighs us down is sin. And perhaps we say, well, I clear my account on a daily basis just like Apostle Paul. But I pray that we would do that on a daily basis, that it would not have sin that is unconfessed on our account, that we would not gamble with the time, not knowing how much time we really have here on earth, but that we would take that seriously, that we have to lay these things aside, free ourselves from these things, so that when the time comes that either we are called because we pass away, or we're called to be taken up by the Lord because of his return, that we would be free, that we'd be able to gladly fly away into the new world. It is probably easier said than done, but we have Jesus as an example. Jesus who came onto this earth, onto this earth and we know he came in a very humble and simple and almost pathetic way, and yet he was the Lord of Lords. He is the Lord of Lords. He used so much restraint to serve you and I, to live his 30 plus years here on earth as an example. But then also ultimately he gave his life so that you and I can live. He left us a beautiful example, living a life of basically a homeless man, really having nothing to his name. And yet how powerful he was in his ministry. So we're called to do similarly. I'm not saying go and sell your home and live on the streets. But we have to be careful that we don't hang on to it. But that we recognize that it is a blessing from the Lord, that we use it for the furtherance of the Gospels, that we use it to be hospitable, that we use it to serve others, and that we use it to share with others. But that we don't call anything that we own our own, that we deserve it, that we worked hard for it, but that we recognize that everything that we have is from God himself so that we can serve him better. As we look at Jesus' life and see how much restraint he has used, we too are called to do the same, that we recognize that we are God's children and that we have an eternal inheritance, but that we restrain ourselves here on earth to live a simple life like Jesus did, that we would love one another as he has commanded because that is the greatest witness that you can have here on earth. I'm sure that you have had experiences where people that were unchurched realized that when, when my relationship with my brother and sister is right, and they see the love that we have for one another, that they're in awe. They can't help but realize that this is something that I've never experienced, and I'm attracted to it on a personal account. As you see, we have a 16-year-old boy in a wheelchair. And my co-workers who, in a non-judgmental way, are very ungodly people. A neighborhood, people that we sometimes associate with that really don't know God and have no interest in knowing God, were able to witness the overwhelming love of our church when the church rallied together and gathered funds enough for us to be able to purchase a wheelchair accessible van that I could not have afforded. And yet we have a brand new vehicle that we can drive our son around. That is the love that shows others around us who we really are and that God is within us and that we are his people. That's just one example, a personal testimony of ours, but we're encouraged to be Christ-like here on earth so that people can see 
in this dark world where there is really nothing good that we can report anymore, that they could see that the good news is alive today, the good news that today is still able to save lives. And as we journey through life, that we would not do that in a selfish way like the world does, but that we would consider one another. That as we get together like this, that we would remind ourselves and each other who we really are, that our place here on earth is temporary, that even though we have homes that are built with brick and mortar, that really they are like a tent. It's just a dwelling that we live in temporarily as we serve the Lord. We don't belong to this world. We are not citizens of this world. And yes, we all carry a passport of some country. But deep down, we are citizens of a world to come. We need to encourage one another, remind ourselves as we go through difficulties that these things that we experience, whether that's ups or downs, are temporary because we only live here as if we were in some kind of a waiting loop, a waiting room, waiting to be called in for our appointment and to never return to that waiting room again, but to remain in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. I was so moved when even yesterday, the, the special numbers, especially the last number, this world is not my home. Those are songs we need to sing together. We need to remind ourselves that this is not where we belong. And I love the setting because as we're pulled away from our homes, pulled away from our church into this rustic place, it drives that point across that our dwelling here is temporary. We are just passing through. And how beautiful. It should excite us. It should give us joy to know that this is not forever, but that we get to spend eternity with Christ himself, face to face. My friend outside of Christ, you are also called to lay aside every weight and every sin that affects you or holds you down or weighs you down. And you can't do that on your own. Just as you can't develop faith on your own, it is a gift from the Lord. But the Lord calls you, and I'm sure you have experienced where the Lord knocks on your heart, maybe gives you a sleepless night, and you realize that the state that you're in is not the state you want to remain in. He's calling you to also cast away all those things that hold you back. Looking at Jesus, the perfect example, who is willing to blot it all out, erase everything that you have done that was evil or sinful, so that you can start a new chapter in life, a new chapter where he becomes your Lord and Savior. He becomes the one who will lead the way so you can follow him, the one that will forgive all you need to do is lay your burdens at the cross of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. The beautiful salvation story is not complicated. What complicates it is humans. We make it complicated in our own minds because we put so many hurdles and so many extra steps in there. But the word is so clear that the Lord is willing to forgive today and harden not your heart. Today when he's calling you is a perfect opportunity because you don't know if tomorrow you will still be with us. My prayer is that we would all reflect on our own lives, not on the life of my neighbor, of the one that maybe sits next to me, but on our own lives and see what weighs me down, what prevents me from serving the Lord to the fullest of my capacity, what holds me back that if the Lord were to return today, would I have anxiety in my heart? Or would my heart leap for joy? But that we would also be honest with, with ourselves. And that we would not just identify those things, but that we would take the opportunity and remove them, lay them aside. So that when the day comes, we would gladly, like the song where this is, I'll fly away, O glory. That we would be able to go and not look back. 
They would not hold on to anything and not end up like Lot's wife, but rather that we would never look back and just look forward because knowing that what is coming is so much greater than what we have here on earth. As we spend the rest of the day here, perhaps we can encourage one another with, as the um, Word of God even says, let me read that. that we would spend the day today, as Ephesians 5 says, that we would speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our own hearts, that we would encourage one another, that we would realize that we do walk hand in hand, and that we hopefully will all together end up in the presence of our Lord. That is my wish for all of us, and may the Lord bless his few words to our hearts. Amen.